So now that we have a sense of the logic of inquiry and um, of some of the different methods, so kind of beginning of some of the different methods, I want to talk about what it means to design a project. Um, because as students, I'd like you to think not just about research as something that other people do and you evaluate, but as something that you yourself can participate in. And so we might ask, how can you effectively design a research project? Well, the first thing that you need to do when designing a project is to think about variables. Now, variables are an observable characteristic that can have one or more possible value. It's a little bit of a scholastic definition, but it's important to note that your variables are things that have to vary. They have to be multiple values or categories of the thing that you're interested in. So the first thing that we do when thinking about a variable is sort of figure out what our unit of analysis is going to be, what you want to observe for a study. That is, what do you want to collect information about. Often, the unit of analysis will be individual people in the social sciences. So we could say, I'm really interested in individuals. And so my unit of analysis and my unit of observation is going to be the individual. So you might want to know about their income, their satisfaction with local politics, their attitudes about the environment. But sometimes, what you're interested in might be not individuals. So you could be interested in organizations. Interested in an organization would mean, do businesses have a more diverse employees, uh, excuse me, do businesses that have a more diverse workforce do better financially than those that don't? In that instance, I'd be interested in analyzing the dynamics of organizations. By contrast, I could be interested in other things like nations. So I could ask, do nations that rely upon oil have different environmental policies than nations that rely upon tourism? So I know that some nations rely heavily on oil for their wealth. Um, Norway uh, is one. So too is the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. My, I might ask, what is the impact of that reliance on oil on their environmental policies? The answer, if you think about it, is going to be really complicated. So here, what I'm looking at is different levels of analysis. And by levels of analysis, I mean sometimes I'm interested in the individual. Sometimes I'm interested in the organization. Sometimes I'm interested in the nation. You shouldn't think of uh, levels of analysis as more or less specific, like the individual is a really specific level of analysis and the nation is a more abstract level. They're simply different levels. So I want to give you a brief example of this. It's an example I use frequently. There are different ways to study water. One way to study water is to look at H2O. So you look at the dynamics of hydrogen and oxygen atoms and how it is that they interact with one another. How is it that hydrogen and oxygen bond to one another? What is the strength of that bond? This would be a way to study water where you're interested in the small molecular components of water and the ways in which those small molecular components influence water. I could also be interested, though, in water not on a molecular level, but instead to be interested in some of the basic properties of water. So what do we know about water? Well, we know some interesting things about water. It seems like, um, uh, well, it seems when uh, water has a certain freezing temperature at zero degrees Celsius and a boiling temperature at 100 degrees Celsius, you know, and this would be something important to kind of know about when it's in different states. When is water in a solid state, a liquid state, and a gaseous state? What are the different temperatures or, and or pressures under which that happens? We also know that water has a surface tension. So we could be deeply interested in the surface tension of water. So you probably have seen bugs uh, walk on water before. And how do they do that? Well, it's because water as a body has a certain degree of surface tension. We know that when water freezes, it expands. It's an interesting quality to water. All of these things tell us something about water. They're, it's different, not unrelated to, but different than the molecular level. It's a different level of analysis. 
Finally, there are some scholars who are interested in like water in terms of large bodies of water. So limnologists are people who study lakes. And the study of lakes as large bodies of water tells us in some, is in some ways a study of a broader ecosystem, but they're also interested in how it is that large bodies of water function. What does it mean that there's a lot of water together or maybe a little bit less water? And what are the consequences of that? These are different levels of analysis. Similarly, in the social sciences, we engage in different levels of analysis. Sometimes we think about individuals. Sometimes we think about the genetics of individuals and the impact of those genetics on their behaviors. Sometimes we think about, you know, individuals as a to total thing. Other times we think about organizations. What is a school? How is it that schools function? And other times we think about larger entities like states and the interrelationship between them. As we begin to study phenomenon, one of the things that we have to ask is what is our unit of analysis? Are we interested in the individual, the interactional, the organizational, or the large scale national units of analysis? And they're not more specific or more vague, they're just different and they're, they can be valuable for that. In addition to units of analysis, we have units of observation, what we actually look at. And units of observation are intimately tied to variables. Now, a variable, as I said before, is an observable characteristic that can have more than one possible answer or value. And this is essential for a variable. A variable has to vary. It may seem like a really, really simple and even stupid thing for me to say, but it's absolutely essential for the social scientist. Values of the variable have to change. You need to have multiple values of the thing. Why? Well, as I said in the previous lecture, in order to generate an, an explanation, what you need to observe is co-variation or two things changing. So if you only have one value of your variable, you're not gonna have that thing change because it's constant, it's always the same thing. So as you construct your variable, what you're gonna wanna do is see how it is that your variable has multiple values. Now, there are four types of variables, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. Nominal are sometimes also referred to as categorical or categories of things. And categories of things can't be ranked. This is the critical thing about nominal or categorical data. They cannot be ranked. So race or ethnicity, gender, are common sociological examples. There's no way to say that one gender is higher or more than another. They're just different things. They're different categories of things. Nations are categories of things. You know, we may be interested in different wealth of nations, so how much their GDP is, and that could be ranked. But the nations themselves, the, the idea, like the U, United States is not one more than Mexico. It's just different than Mexico. Women are not one more than men. They're just different than men, at least in our variable analysis. And so it, there's, just as there's no way to say one race is higher or bigger than another in, in any meaningful sense, the Nominal data are just categories of things that cannot be ranked. Ordinal data are things that can be ranked, but we can't judge the exact difference between the answers. Lots of different variables fall into this category. So if you look at the thing that's before us here the, the, on, the, on the slide, where we go from poor to fair to average to good to excellent, these are different values and they can be ranked. We know that fair is better than poor, average is better than fair, good is better than average, excellent is better than good. So, or we could say, how satisfied are you? Not very satisfied, satisfied, very satisfied. We can actually rank them. We can put them in a clear order. The critical thing is that we don't know the exact distance between these things. So we don't know the exact distance between fair and average, or the exact difference between average and good. It doesn't, it doesn't quite make sense for us to think in that way. 
Like, you know, in the, in the image above, for instance, is good 50% better than average? Is it 100% better? Is it 23% better? We have no idea. All we know within ordinal data is that we have categories of things that can be ranked, where it's possible to actually rank them, but we don't know the distance between the ranks. So um, here, uh, um, uh, uh, ordinal data are incredibly common. Now, if we look at our graph here for a moment, I want us to return to the critical thing of what a variable is. There's a challenge with this graph. We don't actually have many categories of things that are poor or fair. They only make up 3%. And this actually shows us a problem with our variable as we've constructed it, because there's not a ton of variation in our variable. So when we look at these things, we kind of can evaluate this and say, maybe the question we asked wasn't the greatest. Interval data can be ranked, and we know the exact difference between them. Height is a really good example of this. If you are 170 meters tall, I mean centimeters tall, excuse me. If you're 170 meters tall, you're quite tall. But if you're 170 centimeters tall, you are two centimeters shorter than someone who is 172 centimeters tall. And you are two centimeters taller than someone who is 168 centimeters tall. In this sense, interval data can be ranked and we know the exact difference between them. Um, the difference between interval and ratio data is sort of, um, it's, it, it's small, but it's critical. Ratio data is the same as interval data, but in addition, it has a real zero value. So not all things that have um, exact differences between them have a true zero, but some have a true zero. Income is an example. So if I make $10 an hour versus 11 versus nine, the difference between 10 and 11 is the same as the difference between 10 and nine, or nine and 10. It's $1, and that's a meaningful difference that is consistent across all categories of the thing. But unlike height, where it's not meaningful to say that someone is zero inches tall, for income, zero has a meaningful value. We can rank income. We know the exact differences between them. And someone really can have zero income, and that is a meaningful value. The reason we make this distinction is that we often do different kinds of mathematical analyses within the social sciences. And within those mathematical analyses, knowing whether or not there's a true zero is very important for different kinds of math that we do. I'm not going to get into that right now or really in this course at all. But if you're interested in this, you should definitely take a statistics course because the different kinds of data that we have, nominal data, ordinal data, interval and ratio data, enable different kinds of mathematical analyses. And those different kinds of mathematical analyses allow you to have different kinds of insights. So this distinction that we're making about types of variables is crucially, crucially important when we want to do different kinds of, of, in particular, quantitative analyses. Because whether or not we're dealing with categories of things or nominal data or continuous things like ratio data allows us to do different kinds of analyses. I'm going to say that those analyses aren't necessarily better or worse, but you cannot do an analysis of the kind that you would do with ratio data on nominal data. And so you need to know the differences in the types of variables that you're working with. Variables have are, exist in kind of two categories. Um, there's actually more than two, but I'm going to only focus on two. Um, one is an independent and a dependent variable. So um, as I said before, and I'm going to say many, many, many times, in order to observe a relationship between variables, you need co-variation. Both of the variables need to vary together. 
If one thing changes and the other thing um, doesn't change, you don't have an explanation. You don't have a relationship between variables. So you need the things to change in some patterned way together. And what that means is that when you're making observations, you need to have multiple observations of each instance of the variable, or you need to have multiple categories of the variable. So looking back to this chart here, the reason I said that this I may have a few issues to it is that there, isn't re there aren't really many instances of poor as an answer. And so I don't really have many categories of that variable. I, so when I'm looking at variables, what I'm constantly seeking is how is it that two things change? And as I've said earlier in other lectures, the things can change in different ways. They can go up together. They can go down together. They can, one can go down and the other can go up. One can go up and the other can go down. There are lots of different ways in which variables can change, but they have to change together. Another way of putting this that you might hear a scholar say is, you cannot explain a variable by a constant. If one thing is not changing and another thing is changing, the thing that's not changing cannot explain the thing that is changing. So, we make a distinction here between independent variables and dependent variables. Independent variables are the things that cause the change. Dependent variables depend on the independent variable. They are affected by the independent variable. The dependent variable, we're trying to explain it, to predict its value. That, so the thing that we're trying to explain is the dependent variable. Here, let me give you an example. An example would be a dependent variable of earnings, how much money you make. And so then I might ask, what are the independent variables that explain those earnings? What are the sets of things that might explain it? And so I might say that my independent variable is education and my dependent variable are earnings. Here then, um, what I'm interested in is the effect of education on earnings, where education is my independent variable, the thing that causes the change in the world, how much money you make. And the dependent variable is the thing I'm interested in explaining, why it is that people have different incomes. For those of you who are interested or have a mathematics background, there is a reason why I put X and Y on these graphs. If you've ever done some algebra, you've probably seen Y equals MX plus B as a formulation. That is, there is some dependent variable that is explained by some degree of a slope, if it's a linear process, of some other variable. Now, if you're not, if you're already lost, don't worry, it's totally fine. But if you are sort of oriented to algebra a little bit, stay with me for just a moment. What many of the, uh, us scholars do is begin to what we call model the relationship between a dependent variable like income given often multiple dependent variables. And sometimes we conceptualize this as a linear relationship, how one unit change leads to another unit change. Other times we don't. We can think about it in nonlinear ways. And we can often add multiple different independent variables. So I could see how earnings are explained by education, race, country of origin, gender, human capital, so a set of skills that you might have. And this allows me to look and model the ways in which a relationship in the social world works. Okay, for those of you who aren't interested in math, I'll, I'll return now. You can stop, you can start paying attention again. The idea here is that we're thinking about the covariation between two factors and how one of them might explain the other. And the ways in which we do this is almost always to construct a hypothesis. I'm gonna stop here, and in the next lecture, I'm gonna talk about a hypothesis and how it is that we generate a hypothesis and then test or evaluate that hypothesis. And this will include doing a range of things like
turning our variables into something we actually measure.